Uh, hello, and welcome to our conversation really about recognizing and minimizing barriers to justice. We're going to have a conversation sort of focused on how to do this in the context of our intimate partner violence cases. I'm really proud to be here with my colleague, Patricia Powers. Hello. Hi, Jane. I'm glad to be here with you. And this is a very important conversation. I've really been looking forward to it. Uh, yes, and uh, we're lucky enough to work together at Equitas. We're both attorney advisors, um, having prosecuted these cases in the course of our career, and now hopefully uh, doing our job to bring you in innovative, informed, and hopefully really practical strategies that you can apply in your work um, sort of right off the bat. Of course, Equitas serves as a resource for you um, beyond this series on intimate partner violence prosecutions. We have a lot of public facing resources online, webinars, articles, statutory compilations. We're also available to do um, larger scale, smaller scale training events and one-on-one -on -one consultations. I know Patty and I really think I don't know, it's my one of my favorite things about the job is working with prosecutors that may just need a, a sounding board or someone to go through some case specific um, research or strategies. And then we're also involved uh, at Equitas on, on several national level partnerships and initiatives, uh, including the Sexual Assault Kit Initiative um, and the Enhanced Collaborative Model Human Trafficking Task Force Initiative, along with many others as well. You can learn more about us online on our website or by following us on any of these forms of social media. Uh, we always are pushing out new trainings, new resources, things that could help in your work um, collaboratively and in your discipline specific work as well. We're really proud that our work is supported by the Office of Violence Against Women. We're able to do this under this generous grant and support, um, although it doesn't mean that everything we say today is necessarily reflecting the views of the Department of Justice. In as part of our mission to give you the most informed and innovative work, we're often pulling from the latest social science, uh, case law, and building upon others' work, and we do that under the Fair Use Doctrine, always providing citations and acknowledgement when um, possible. So today, Patty, we're going to try to take all the complexity <laughs> of trauma that might be experienced by survivors of intimate partner violence, and really look at that through um, sort of a greater lens, a broader lens of not only the traumatic experience they've had maybe throughout a lifetime, but then how the offender impacts that so that we can really meet the victim where they're at when we do our work. Um, and we'll talk about some strategies to break down maybe barriers to participation or minimize those barriers while prioritizing victims' safety, privacy, and autonomy. And sometimes these are, you know, real points of tension uh, in our work. So let's, I'm going to ask you first, just start off by giving us some, you know, your foundational views on this, this term trauma-informed that we, we hear a lot, but you know, what does it really mean in the context of a prosecutor to be trauma-informed? As a prosecutor and also as allied professionals, it's so important for us to be able to recognize trauma. A victim may not be in a position to be able to explain or describe trauma. So it's really incumbent upon us to recognize some of the features of trauma. And in this process, we really need to acknowledge that trauma may be different for uh, one victim than for another victim. We're able to identify general signs of trauma that we see commonly reflected by victims, but it's also important to acknowledge that any particular victim may express trauma differently. So what does it mean to be trauma-informed? It means that we are open to and desirous of understanding the impact of trauma on a victim. And to do that, we need to look for it. We need to be sensitive to the victim and any expression that the victim is able, is able to make uh, relative to trauma to really come to understand it. The second feature 
of our work that's so important is to bear in mind that it is the offender who inflicted trauma and who is responsible for the victim's trauma. A victim may present to us in our work as prosecutors at the office with difficulty explaining their experience of the crime. A victim may not be able to give us precise details and certainly not a chronology of what happened. And we need to step back and look at that because it's very likely what we're seeing is part of the impact of trauma, uh, an impact on a victim that takes away the ability to form a chronological sequence of that experience and sometimes even to be able to disclose what happened at all. We know that delayed disclosure is a very common feature um, and delayed disclosure is in fact uh, part of trauma and in most cases it's caused by the offender where a victim may not have an ability to make that disclosure. And I think it's so important for us to recognize those two things. First, that trauma may be very specific, although there are some general signs and features. And secondly, it's nearly always caused by the offender. Mm -hmm. And I love your already the language you're using, um, you know, that a victim is not able to participate. And I think just that language shift is also a mind shift in thinking about who is to who is to blame for this? It's right. the offender. You know, and I think that's a really important point too, Jane, because that word able is really the infrastructure for trauma because it it helps it helps us understand a victim's ability to make a disclosure or to provide information and how that can be impacted by the offender's infliction of trauma. The other thing I'd note too, in terms of presenting the victim's testimony, ultimately at trial, we're going to be asking a victim what they are able to tell us about what happened. And that word in that sense becomes a very powerful representation of the infrastructure of trauma that enables us to really help describe that reality to a jury. Mm -hmm. So I think when I started doing this work, um, I didn't have any specialized training on trauma. And my first uh, assignment was our misdemeanor domestic violence unit. And um, I learned, I've learned so much over the years, um, but I continue to learn um, a lot of times in partnership with our victim service professionals and those folks that are working directly with victims who have then explained to me, we're not talking necessarily about trauma that happened because of this physical assault. We're not really limited to this physical trauma that oftentimes our victims will present to us with an amalgamation and combination of really complex trauma. Absolutely, and that's another excellent point. And when we look at this graphic, it really does illustrate some of the dimensions of, of trauma for any particular victim. As we noted earlier, there may be some common expressions, but the individual experience is so critical for us to come to understand as well. It could be spiritual, a victim losing a part of a, of a faith or belief system because of an event that happened that frankly overwhelmed all resources that the victim had. The trauma can be physical, the, the offender's infliction of physical trauma and domestic violence or sexual assault. And it can be acute. It can be something that is momentarily extremely traumatic. And it may be, it may be the, uh, an expression of pain or it could be psychological pain as well. Uh, a betrayal of trust that literally took from a victim all faith and, and belief that a victim had in a person that they're in a relationship with. And all of a sudden, there's a drastic and dramatic change. So the psychological trauma could even be overpowering in that regard, as well as the physical trauma. Sexual violence is also very important, invading, invading the victim's sense of self. And while a victim is trying to recapture that sense of personal reality, there's another overlay of trauma that's making that even more difficult with some of the other features that we see here. Historical trauma, uh, being, a, being a member of a culture that has been oppressed for centuries and there's shared knowledge and experience that to this very day, 
will impact a victim and, and how they respond to trauma. Environmental trauma, we also see that as well. So I think one of the things that's very important for us as prosecutors is to know that trauma can be multidimensional. It isn't just physical or and or psychological. There are so many other facets to it, all of which we need to come to know in an effort to come to understand the victim's reality, who the victim is and who the victim was before the offender committed this crime and inflicted this trauma. Mm -hmm. I think that's so important to recognize that someone may be coming to us because of an acute trauma, like someone called 911, something happened, but um, they also come to us with their life long experience, which may include overlapping and in multiple forms of trauma. And, you know, these may not be easy for a victim to talk about. So I think our understanding of these dimensions, as well as being fully present to the victim during an interview, so we can hear oftentimes these very subtle reflections of trauma in a victim's life. And I often think about you know, offenders tactics. We did uh, a spoke by spoke of the power and control wheel in the first um, of this series. Um, but what strikes me sometimes is that an offender is, is um, very calculated in which tactics work for which person, right? So it can be, um, you know, a very precise and deliberate tactics and they can play upon known vulnerabilities that may be related to previous trauma or, or tra traumatic experiences that a victim has. So how do those tactics interplay with maybe complex or compound trauma when we look at this overall wheel? You know, and the first point I think that's very important for us to make, and that's a great word, tactics, because this is conduct that is intentional and it's conduct that is very frequently premeditated. The desired effect for many offenders is to suppress a victim's ability to disclose the crime, to maintain control, whether it's through economic threats, it could be coercion, it could be a direct threat. If you tell anyone, I'm going to kill you. If you communicate anything that's happened to anybody else, I will see to it that you lose the children. Sometimes also, you drove me crazy, you made me do this. I'm not the kind of person that would ever become angry, but look at you, you've caused me, you've caused me to do all of these things. You have this responsibility. And there are these features and many others besides that, but the core reality is this victim is accessible to the offender. The offender knows the victim's vulnerabilities better than anyone does in a relationship. An offender can prey upon those vulnerabilities and use them in an effort to commit the crime. And then finally, the offender being a member of our community believes that a victim may not be heard or may not be understood by others. And it's so important to know, this is not our view of credibility. It is the offender's view of credibility. And this, and again, again, is used by the offender to maintain power and control over a victim and ultimately make it, make it impossible or unlikely that a victim's going to be able to step forward out of that control to be able to tell us about the crime. Mm -hmm. So I put up a couple of examples here that I was thinking about. Um, <clears throat> one of them being sort of the use of children. And because offenders, like you said, they know their victims better than anyone. So if they know their victim, that's their greatest fear, or perhaps they come from a community that has been in, impacted by the historical trauma of forced boarding schools and children being taken away from their families. Well, that use of children as a tactic is almost, um, you know, the effectiveness of that tactic is, is doubled, tripled, uh, because they know that this is the right button to push for this person. Exactly. And that's a great example. And we do see this frequently, not only in cases where 
there has been historical trauma with the loss of children or children going to boarding schools or being taken by the state and put in foster care settings. But we see it in other situations where the offender wants to convince the victim that the victim is not a good parent. And in that process starts building that fear, you're not a good parent. A victim may be self-medicating using drugs or alcohol because of violence in the home. An offender in turn will use this when the authorities find out about what you're doing. You're, you're no longer staying away from alcohol or you're no longer staying away from drugs. You're going to lose the children. You're going to lose everything. You're going to be on the streets. But this in and of itself is, is such a threat uh, to a parent that it becomes a, a major source of an offender maintaining control over a victim's ability to disclose. Mm -hmm. I also saw a lot of uh, spiritual trauma inflicted in, in, in cases where um, the, the sort of sacrament of the marital vows um, that we got married, you know, under God, and that this was such a strong cultural tie to themselves, their families, and their communities, that the offender could almost position the victim as it's it's your fault. The, the greater evil here is you compromising our marriage by going forward with this case. And that's a great point also. You know, sometimes offenders will misuse uh, commonly held religious beliefs to create, again, fear in a victim that a victim is violating uh, an important rule or an important consideration or value in a religion and then takes on even more self-blame. As we know, so many victims blame themselves, but offenders knowing this will add to and augment this blame using just about anything that they can. And using spiritual trauma has been commonly used by offenders also. And this is something, again, that we want to carefully discuss with victims to try to understand, first of all, their religious values, and then to carefully turn to how the offender is engaging in manipulation so that we can begin to share insight with the victim so that they can step back and see perhaps what the offender's tactic is and what the offender's goal is in that process. Mm -hmm. uh, and the last example here I had was uh, environmental trauma. And um, the first thing that came to my mind when I learned about this environmental trauma and these just feelings of hopelessness and powerlessness that comes from it was um, the Flint, Michigan uh, water crisis and how whole communities must feel like Nobody cares about my health or my children's health or anyone's in this community. Um, and therefore sort of like, if the government can't even give us clean water, how am I gonna engage in, in a system like the criminal justice system? And if we have a, an offender who's of, who has some level of privilege that can all be exacerbated. Again, when we talk about the offender's level of privilege, we're also talking about the offender's ability to control a victim's circumstance, especially a victim who doesn't have resources, a victim living in poverty, a victim living in challenged circumstances during the COVID-19 pandemic is another example. A victim who has lost a support network uh, with, with persons who, who may have been uh, affected by COVID in one way or another, but are no, long, no longer amenable or available to support the victim. An offender has control in that sense where the offender can take away even more resources from a victim, creating that aloneness, uh, the a feeling of desperation. And what the offender wants from this is, you need me. And without me, you have nothing. And that is, I think, ultimately an offender tactic that is used, again, to maintain victims in, in control so that they're not able to step out of this crisis or this situation to seek support and to disclose. Mm -hmm. And I think trauma explains a lot of um, sort of those challenges to participation. 
But there are some other factors too I wanted to talk to you about. And with always the view of, okay, if these are the challenges, what are some strategies? Um, and I, I think, you know, we have trauma on here and went through sort of some of the complexities, although that could have been, you know, an entire presentation itself. Um, and it's closely related to fear. And I always think of, you know, the first thing is the fear of, of some sort of physical violence. Um, but really, when I started speaking with survivors and victims, that, that element of fear is much broader than just, I'm afraid of getting beaten. It would seem like that would probably be even lower on the, sometimes the rung of, what are you afraid of? Now, when we look at when we look at fear, again, it's so important for us to be fully present to the victim, to come to understand to the extent that we can the victim's reality. And it can be a fear of physical harm. Many victims are, are threatened with their death. It can also be, as we've been discussing, a fear of losing the children. It can be a fear of a loss of privacy. Uh, some victims have discussed when making a disclosure, they feel like they're stepping into headlights and that everyone in the community, if not the world, is going to know about their situation and is going to be judgmental about it. Victims are so accustomed to being blamed by the offender, they have a very real and palpable fear that they're going to be blamed by everyone. They also fear that they may not be heard, their voices may not be heard, and their voices may not be understood by professionals in the criminal justice system. Again, that fear all begins with the offender and how the offender tries to shape and condition the victim's view of any kind of support system. Trauma can certainly be a reason why a victim is unable to participate. And then we turn to witness tampering and we see this in so many cases. And we also see it accomplished in so many ways by an offender. An offender in custody may be directly calling from the jail and may try be trying to convince or persuade a victim not to testify, not to uh, continue participating in our work. Sometimes an, event, an offender may use emotional appeals. Do you remember how good things were earlier? Well, they can be that way again. Just give me an opportunity and we'll be a family again. And we've all seen those letters and we've listened to those phone calls. But the other consideration as well is a potential perception of lack of services. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, many victims feel that there is not medical care or support for children um, with, uh, with disabilities or even extending babysitting services for children. They don't think that those are still available because of the pandemic. And perhaps a victim even needs specialized services. Maybe therapeutic counseling is necessary to help treat the trauma that has been inflicted on the victim. And then we look at a feature of a failure of communication. And it all goes back to our responsibility, I think, as prosecutors and allied professionals to truly hear the voice of the victim and to listen so carefully and to put other considerations out of our mind as we engage in a, in a very strong effort to try to understand the victim's reality and what the victim's needs are that we might have the privilege of supporting if the victim is able to make the disclosure and is able to participate in our work. So when we look at an inability to participate, we're looking at so many different dimensions of fear. And we need to bear in mind also that the offender is very cognizant of all of these fears and certainly is in a position to try to manipulate a victim based upon these fears. I love one of the ways that that magic word able, and in this case, inability, this version of it, it kind of does a good job of putting the onus on us, right? So I'm going to take this and look at this and say, you know, the victim's not able to participate because X, Y, and Z. What can I do to break down those barriers or to um, alleviate some of those fears or to connect them with resources or services. And I like the fact that it, it kind of puts that onus 
on us. And Jane, I think that is such a great point because it really is our responsibility. And I think even taking it a step forward, I think we need to be proactive to the extent that we can. We need to try to allay fears that we have reason to believe that the victim has, and even to answer questions before a victim has that burden placed on themselves. If an offender, for example, is incarcerated, we know that so many victims are really concerned that they're going to be let out of custody because of the virus being present in the custodial setting. And they're worried that even if the offender is arrested, that they're going to get out. So I think that's only one example that we can actually discuss with the victim and try to remove that responsibility, that burden from the victim to be able to come up with the questions that they need to have answered. Mm -hmm. And that's a great example of where we've got the fear, the need for communication, maybe a distrust of the system, the need for resources, and it all kind of comes together. And we're in a, you know, as prosecutors, like, I love when you say this, you know, we have the honor and the privilege Yes. of being in a place and a role that can um, can help um, even from just the communication and the uh, education and then putting people in touch with the right people in our communities that we need to, of course, also know about. And that's part of our role as well. That's the experience that you and I had as prosecutors. And that's why we're passionate about prosecution. That was so eloquently said. <laughs> Um, I just want to put like a bit of a, you know, attack in this, in this ingrained distrust, um, because I, I think to really build trust, we have to acknowledge that in some cases, the distrust that a victim may come to us with is, is one that um, unfortunately is based on experience, based on offender tactics that were used with the express purpose of dissuading and preventing victims to seek outside help, to seek yes. resources. And unfortunately, I think this third piece we have to acknowledge, which is that a lot of our a lot of victims that we serve will have had prior bad experience with systems. And of course it's you know it's hard to say, well, that wasn't me, that wasn't me that did that to you as Jane Anderson prosecutor, um, but we have to kind of acknowledge like we are, we do represent more than ourselves as Jane Anderson prosecutor and that we do represent to, to victims a, a system or an entire sort of cadre of all prosecutors and how do we work with that? Well, you know, I think first and foremost, what's so important is to develop a sense for ingrained distrust. This may not be immediately articulated by a victim, but learning about cultures of other persons with, with cultural humility, reaching out to allied professionals who can help educate us as to historical impact with many members of our, of our populations, we can come to understand the presence of ingrained distrust and be able to ask appropriate questions to allow the victim a true opportunity to be heard. And a victim's voice can express in so many different ways, uh, the level of trauma, what, what the experience was of not only the victim, but the victim's family. It can be multi-generational. The fear that developed from one generation to the next, never seeing any changes made, never seeing improvements and almost having a sense of hopelessness. And that really comes out very palatably in, in terms of distrust. Can I trust you? Are you going to walk with me through this process? And by that, I mean, do you understand me? Are you going to be here with me? And so I think developing an initial sense of distrust is one initial feature of building rapport uh, with the victim to better understand where they're coming from and what we can do to help respond. And I think you just like, just hit so many of these, um, you know, sort of key practice tips of how do we disrupt that, that cycle. Um, and I'm really, 
honored and privileged to work with um, in the context of one of our human trafficking projects, um, a group of survivor advocates that bring both their lived and now really impressive professional experience uh, to our work. And when asked like, how can we improve this interaction? Uh, they're like, oh, just care, just treat us like humans. And I was like, <laughs> um, and I don't know, you, you mentioned this already, this, this phrasing of cultural humility. I think in the past we used, I, I had heard the phrase cultural competency and I love the shift. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about why we make use that word cultural humility. Now, what it is, it's an acknowledgement, I think, first and foremost, that we're all in this together. And it is relating to the victim as another human being. And it's an openness, and it's really an understanding of our vulnerability as a human being and relating to the vulnerability of another human being. And we know however much enriching information we can obtain from allied professionals, we cannot know truly how it is to be in the victim's shoes, in the victim's position. But we can respect that with such depth coming from our own personality that I think it does project an openness and, and a humility, if you will, to another human being. I think it's so important to reflect upon the reality that we are all human and we're all in this together. And as she mentioned a few minutes ago, Jane, we as prosecutors have the privilege, certainly the honor of, of giving voice to a victim whose voice has been taken from them. And this is such an overwhelming honor for prosecutors to be able to be in the room with the victim who's made a courageous decision to step forward. I think that really is the highest calling of our profession. Mm -hmm. Um, I think a couple of other things here we talked about that need to be transparent, especially with the uh, unknown that COVID-19 has brought to a lot of our work um, and being constantly checking in um, and being transparent and recognizing, hey, you know, I don't know, managing expectations a little bit. I, I said this pre-COVID-19, talking about the timeline and making sure folks you know, it wasn't going to resolve in the timeline that it happens on TV, that these cases will take a while. And, um, and I see that is probably even more so uh, necessary now. Um, be transparent about what our roles and responsibilities are, what, where the limits of our um, roles and responsibilities take us, uh, being consistent and, you know, walking the walk. Um, you know, much easy, much better than talking the talk, although uh, communication being key and, and transparency being key, but really demonstrating um, what we say if we, if we, if we say things like, um, you know, we see you as a victim, and we recognize this victimization, well, then we probably shouldn't be threatening them with arrest or uh, threatening to have, you know, their children taken away. Um, and so being really clear about that as well. One, one feature of disrupting the cycle that, that you mentioned that I think is really important to build on, for a victim, the feeling is that their life is being placed on hold while we do our work. And the pandemic is making that challenging in so many jurisdictions around the country. But as prosecutors, we really need to do our best to advance these cases to justice. Every moment is critical for the victim, especially a victim who has been living in fear and is trying to break out of that environment. So advancing these cases diligently to the best of our ability is really at the heart of our work in trying to meet the victim's needs. And demonstrating that even if we're unsuccessful, letting them know these are the arguments I'm going to make. I'm going to push this forward. I'm going to do everything I can. Exactly. Um, so one of the tension points in all of this, I wanted to acknowledge and maybe get your your um, your position on, which is this this idea of like, okay, so a victim is unable to participate, um, and maybe they've even articulated to us, um, I do, I want the case dropped. I don't want this to go forward. 
Um, and we, we talk about wanting to um, acknowledge and allow for the victim to have some measure of autonomy. Oftentimes that was previously taken away from them by the offender. So how do we as prosecutors balance sort of our duty as a prosecutor um, and so our duty to our community, our ethical duties um, with this idea of we really wanna value um, victim autonomy. Well, we've already talked about in an earlier presentation about an evidence-based prosecution. And certainly that's part of the context of what we're going to uh, discuss when we try to respect a victim's decision or if a victim is unable uh, to continue pursuing prosecution. We have a duty to the victim uh, to protect the victim. We have a duty to the community, but we also have a responsibility to the victim. And so in terms of our work balancing, we want to hold offenders accountable. We need to know what justice represents to a victim in every individual case. It may not be the same that it, that it is for us as prosecutors, but still what we need to do is to ensure a victim's safety. We need to have a candid conversation about our goal in the prosecution and what we want to accomplish for the victim and to hear and to listen very carefully to what the victim's response is. And we may find out that a victim is again, looking at justice differently than we are. We want to prepare every one of our cases as an evidence-based prosecution. We, we never know at any point if a victim can be impacted by trauma or threatened to the extent that a victim is unable to appear in court and testify. We might be able to employ other evidentiary resources, including forfeiture by wrongdoing, establishing that the offender intended that result and engaged in conduct to secure the victim's absence or inability to testify. Experts, behavioral experts can also provide a wealth and a depth of insight into victim responses to trauma that really can help us as prosecutors explain the reality of victimization to a jury in a way that members of the jury can actually relate it to their own life experience and come to understand on a deeper level the victim's experience. Uh, Federal Rule of Evidence 404B is a great resource uh, in sexual violence cases, intimate partner sexual violence, or maybe CODIS hits that can lead us to other victims or other bad acts that an offender has engaged in. We really need to, in this regard, be really open to the potential of intimate partner, physical and sexual violence offenders having other victims. It certainly has happened and we need to broaden our perspective of these cases to be aware of that potential and to look for that evidence. Sometimes we'll engage in a creative disposition that addresses offender accountability, perhaps with a certain length of a no contact order and provisions for treatment that are necessary, which might be critical to the victim's ability to engage in that relationship potentially in the future. Specialty courts, family courts can also be very important in taking a look at the broadened experience of the parties when children are involved, when there are custody issues, as well as when there are criminal issues. So there's a myriad of ways uh, for us as prosecutors to pursue offender accountability, but it all goes back to that balancing uh, that you mentioned earlier, Jane. Our responsibility as prosecutors, and we clearly have them, but also the victim's desire for justice. And we need to really engage in this balancing to advance justice for victims and for our communities. Thank you. Um, and I think this is one of the takeaways I had when I was uh, had the privilege of prosecuting domestic violence cases is that um, from leadership down, we were imbued with this sense of, you know, your job here is not merely to obtain convictions. Yes. Um, and that we were um, empowered to think about what justice meant on a case by case basis and to talk to victims about that and to come up with creative dispositions and, and prioritize victim safety and autonomy and, and, and constantly, you know, working through that balancing of, um, of what, what was the right thing to do forward because that's really, you know, what we're tasked with. 
is to um, to do the right thing. And I always thought that was such a that made my job easy. <laughs> you know, all I have to do <laughs> easier said than done, probably. But um, hopefully, this was a, a a great. I know I enjoyed this conversation, and others too, to think about. Um, trauma beyond maybe the more obvious forms that we typically go to, which is the physical or the acute trauma, and really look at that in the lens of offender tactics, because offenders know what tactics will be the most effective against their victims, the people they know best. Um, and so while we look at that, we can then identify and hopefully start minimizing um, some of those barriers. And if we can do that effectively, our chances of maximizing victim participation goes up. But at the end of the day, always being focused on the offenders, both as the ones being responsible for this trauma, for this these victims' fears, um, and try to hold them accountable at the same time of, of that victim-centered approach we wanna take. So Patty, I wanted to thank you for being here today. Uh, it's my information. This is uh, Patty's wealth of knowledge and experience and always so generous with it. And I appreciate it. It's one my last... pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> and one last plug, Equitas puts on office hours the third Thursday of every month. Uh, different topics. It's really an opportunity to um, network with your fellow prosecutors, um, share resources, maybe some emerging trends. I know a lot of folks are, um, you know, the courtrooms are being set up differently and people are trying different things. So it's really a wonderful opportunity to kind of learn beyond your own office practice and get involved um, with our uh, office hours. So that's the plug there. I know, Patty, you're involved in a lot of these too. So we'll see you there. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.